Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a reminder before we start, our home base is wedontdie.com, where you can always find inspiration and comfort. I welcome you to get a free copy of my book. Just go to the store page, scroll down, you'll see the audio book and use coupon code free. Be my guest. Chapter 10 is how to survive grief. And it's a subject I am very passionate about sharing. Also, we offer a free Sunday gathering, which happens two o'clock New York time, but it is global where you can get some inspiration for the week and also be part of a live medium demonstration on Zoom and loved ones do come through. So it's pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. We always have great courses starting as well. So check it all out. On to our show. Our guest today is a retired federal administrative law judge who practiced law for more than 30 years. As many of us, our lives can take an unexpected turn when a loved one passes. Today, we'll hear the story of Karen Johnson about her son, about grief, and the spiritual practices she found and now shares. She is the author of the Hay House published book called Living Grieving, Using Energy Medicine to Alchemize Grief and Loss. You can check out everything she's up to, see some of the book, her blog, and more at her website, which is karenjohnson.net. Karen, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to meet you. I'm meeting a new friend. So this is wonderful, really yeah. wonderful. So as we are just meeting, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where are you are from and tell us a little bit about your past, pretty sure. incredible background being involved with law <laughs> so much. Wow. And I think you were in the service too. Correct? Yep. Yeah, I was in the military, JAG officer, got out as a major. So I always say I've had many incarnations in this lifetime. You know, and then I went to law school and I, you know, I was an only child of an only child. So I had sort of this childhood where we lived out in the country and I had friends that were a friend that was a fairy and a friend that was, um, uh, that lived in a tree and another friend that was in the, not a friend, it was a basement, somebody that scared me, sort of a Indian chief looking person that ended up being spirit guides later on in life, but I didn't know what they were at the time. And, um, so, but then I took this conventional path. Um, I wanted to be an archaeologist or anthropologist, and my parents said, "Oh no, that's too dangerous for girls." And so, you know, you you shouldn't do that. And that was the '50s, and things were so different then. And and uh, when I was born, and so I ended up going to law school and becoming a lawyer and doing that for 30 years and having two children and really didn't think much of anything spiritual. I can't say I was one of those people that did everything. And I admire people that did Reiki and yoga and meditation and all those things, but I wasn't one of those people. And so when my 27-year-old son, who I was super close to, um, passed from a heroin overdose, so he went to a party, got drunk. For some reason, they decided to try heroin and they gave him too much. He was a big guy, 6'8". 280 pounds and they just gave him too much and he died instantly and it threw my world completely apart and I always say in that you know it was a blessing and a curse at the same time because it seeing him after he departed and seeing him come to me and and feeling him around me opened me to the possibility of life after death something that I would not have believed in Even when my parents passed, I said, you know, live is alive, dead is dead. That's it. There's no more. I didn't believe in anything. So I had this huge spiritual awakening, which I'm really grateful for. And he and I still work together, helping souls to transition to the other side. So it's been a journey. Yeah, it sure has. Well, I want to unpack a little bit everything that you said, because first of all, our condolences, obviously, no parent should have to lose their child in such a way. And um, I can't even imagine what you've gone through. And yes, grief does have the opportunity to put us on a spiritual path and really help other people. But if you could just take us back to not really 
well, one, believing one way or the other about the afterlife to his passing and then what opened up. First of all, what's your son's name? Ben. Ben. Okay. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> I know you're watching, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm sure. It was his birthday this week, so it's always oh, tough. Yeah. You know, birthdays and death days. And I'm sure your listeners know that. Those are those days that, you know. And holidays. Birthday. Yeah. Holidays, birthdays, death Brutal. Days. And when, when did he pass? Um, that was 2014. Okay. All right. It's, it's not really long ago in the big scheme no. of things. No. Not at all. Mm. Mm, my dad passed um, 2010, and it still feels like it was just yesterday sometimes. Yes. So, oh. so when you had found out, what were the things that happened that all of a sudden opened you up to this greater reality of communication and signs, maybe? Yeah, so I was, um, I was on a vacation uh, in South Korea with a friend. And I just have felt really funny that day. You know, that afternoon, I felt like something was wrong. Something was wrong. And I got a, a phone call and the person hung up, got my voice. And I'm, I called them right back. I just felt like, even though I didn't know the number, you know, you get those numbers, you don't know. And half the time you ignore them. This one I called back and he said, this is a detective. Where are you? And I said, I'm in South Korea. Why? He said, well, it's your son. And I said, what about him? That he was in an accident. What happened? No, he's, he's dead and he's dead from a heroin overdose. And that just, you know, I mean, there's no words to describe the shock and the horror of all of it. And so um, I was in South Korea. So night is day, day is night. It was evening time. I couldn't get a flight out until the next morning and the flight was 14 hours. So it took 24 hours to get home. And so I, I was just in such shape. And then I, I was at the airport in, so in Seoul, in Seoul, South Korea. And Ben came to me, just his big old self, kind of laughing, smiling. And then he kind of faded away. And so I called my, I had no understanding of what this could possibly be. I called my ex-husband and said, you have to call the ME. I think he's alive. I think he's trying to get out. And so called the ME and the ME very graciously looked and said, no, I'm sorry, he's gone. And then that was the beginning of him being around me and me sensing, seeing, hearing, feeling his presence, um, hearing not so much, actually. I could sense him frantic as I was lay screaming, screaming on the steps. I couldn't even make it up the steps. And I would scream until I threw up and until I threw up blood. So I was really in bad shape. And, and you know, he would, I could feel him. And so I did what my left brain mind would never imagine doing is uh, look in the phone book under mediums. And then to my surprise in um, Northern Virginia, <laughs> the place that's the most highly educated place in the United States, there were in fact many mediums. And so one woman's picture was larger than the other. And I thought, oh, I'll take that one. I didn't know anything about mediums. And so um, she agreed to see me, although she thought it was a little soon. It was about three weeks after he passed. And I went there and I said, he's right here. He flew in behind me. He flew, your husband's over there. He flew in behind your husband. He's standing there. See the candle flickering? That's him moving his hand to let you know where he is. And she so we had a fantastic reading. And then at the end, she said, you know, you might have some skills yourself because most people have no idea that they're loved ones in the room and having these kind of experiences. And so that led me to all sorts of mystical things, uh, mediumship training and Kabbalah and crystals and anything I could do. And it finally led me um, to a, an evolutionary astrologer who told me, so your soul has shifted from shame, blame, guilt, Uranus path to Neptune, the mystical path. And I thought, what, what is that? <laughs> you know? And, and I, I didn't have a framework. So he said, well, a woman who had a, a reading like yours became a shaman. And I said, a shaman? There's still shamans? I had no idea. So then my left brain went out and Googled and up popped the Four Winds Society. And I ended up three weeks later on a plane to Joshua Tree, California for my first class. <laughs> and there it all began. Incredible. So I don't know anything about Four Winds, the training, mm -hmm. anything about that. But one can assume 
because you are the author of a great new book that it, it somehow it ties in with helping you with your grieving, correct? Yeah. So, it, you know, the whole society is a, it's a medicine wheel path. And Alberto Fioto is the, Fioto is the founder. He's written about 20 books. So he, and it's all about shamanism, soul retrieval, um, illuminations, destiny retrieval, all those sorts of things that we learn uh, in our shaman work. And so I trained with him. Um, he trained me, you know, one-on-one -on -one and I now teach for the four winds too. And I teach an um, uh, online shamanism course a couple wow. times a year. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a really amazing journey. And part of the journey was me deciding to sell all my household goods. I still was grieving very deeply and I wanted to understand grief and death and loss. And I went on a two and a half year journey all over the world to, to discover all about grief and loss. And so um, that's sort of the basis of my book, what I found out about grief and how to grieve and, and how we might go through it. We never get over it, but we go through it, how we might go through it in a way that we, can create a new life out of the ashes of the old one that honor our loved ones. And that's kind of, that's kind of where we want to be, I think. Yeah. What are some of the things you learned that helped you? I'm sure there'll be people that pick up your book for sure, but some people, this might be their only opportunity to hear or see you. Right. So the biggest one I think is that, oh gosh, other life events like um, getting married, having children, we know that they, they these events have transformational energy and we look forward to them with excitement. What we don't talk about so much is that grief also has transformational energy. We can transform our lives with the energy of our grieving. And so you know, our, our Western culture really shuts us down and shuts us out. It's time to move on. Let's not talk about that, right? We kind of get pushed aside, shunted aside. We make people uncomfortable. And so that was one of the reasons I left on my two and a half year journey. I knew that I was making people uncomfortable with my grieving. I was not accepting it. I was not buying it. I was not being comfortable. And so I just left everything to travel the world so that I could discover it. And the biggest discovery too, another big discovery is that grief is a journey. We're all on this journey. It's not a one and done sort of thing. It's not time to move on, time to go. Sound bite. You know, our culture is so sound bite. It's like, oh, well, that was yesterday. You're still talking about that? Yeah. <laughs> all right. And so since it is a journey and we're all on our own journey, we can take as long as we want. But we must remember that we are on a journey. And so if we're stuck in our grief, if our home is a shrine and we've become isolated and insulated and we, we've we lost joy in life, then we're stuck and that energy, that stuck energy can result in all sorts of illnesses. And so, and not only does it result in illnesses for us, it keeps our loved ones on the other side from fully doing what they can do on the other side. It's not eternal slumber. They're doing, they're working with ascended masters. They're doing their journey. And so we're kind of holding on to their kite string a little bit when we refuse to move on and stay stuck. And so sometimes our culture kind of puts us in that direction, like, oh, wearing black for the rest of your life and, and staying, you know, inside and not reaching out, not going to parties, not doing anything is sort of like, okay, that's how people in severe grief, grief, and that really shows how much you loved your loved one, right? And we all want our loved one to know. And they already know, they already know that how much we love them. And so this is just hurting us, keeping us stuck, and keeping us stuck in our journey, and also kind of holding on to them. And so as we move out of that stuck place, then we can become lighter. And then we can eventually use our this energy of grief, grief to create a new life. Yeah, I definitely agree with creating a new life when unexpected. I remember hearing about the 
pine trees that are all over the world that need to be subjected to really intense flame and really intense heat when the whole forest is burned down, but it's the only way they can begin growing again. Yeah. And so it does have that transformative experience. I don't personally think that we hold our loved ones back. Um, I've definitely been involved in this for a long time, but I do know that from where they are, they, they want us to be happy they know they're still alive. They want us to continue our lives. And you and I both know that very easily people can die inside when a loved one passes and it could be 20, 30 years or maybe never before they begin this journey. So anything that we can do to help people facilitate that and look at grief as an opportunity, uh, maybe not a pleasurable one right away, but you know, I'm sure you, like me, you know, when you look back on your life, you see everything happened as it did, as horrible as it was, there's been miracles that have shown up. You've, I don't have any doubt that you have served mankind in so many different ways, and none of that would have happened had Ben not done what he did on that day. Oh, for sure. And that's that place where I always say forgiveness is highly overrated. It's when we can get to gratitude, when we can look at even the really hard things in our life and say, okay, thank you. You know, I see how that was important for me, for my evolution, for their evolution, right? I see, I see. And when we can get to the gratitude for it, then we're sort of curing that karma that we came in and we're getting off that karmic loop and beginning to be able to write our own story. Yeah. And gratitude has that power. I did. I don't know why I don't do this more often, but I did a 28 day gratitude practice and I gave gratitude for everything I had in my life and then things I didn't have that I wanted. And Karen started stuff started showing up in my life yeah. that was on that want list because I gave gratitude for it. And I thought, there's something going on here. This is, I mean, I'm having a little few too many synchronicities here, but it all stemmed from gratitude. It does. And I don't know if you're familiar, a lot of people maybe with Greg Braden's book, The Lost Mode of Prayer. And the lost mode of prayer was praying as if it were done. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for this, what I want, right? So that is a way of praying instead of, I wish, I wish I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. Thank you for bringing this. Thank you for that even though it's not here yet. So yeah, you're touching into a mode of prayer that's sort of lost. Yeah, absolutely. Now we all deal with this human brain. I don't know if you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and you're maybe not as positive as you'd like to be, yeah. but we all have that voice of negativity inside of us. How do we deal with that and, and embrace gratitude or embrace, embrace our spiritual journey? Right. So if you look at our different levels of brains in our head, so we have the reptilian brain, fight, flight, all that sort of thing. And that's mostly what we stay in day to day, flight, fright, freeze, you know, all those sorts of things. So if we can get into ceremony, then we begin to start to engage our neocortex. And at the level of the neocortex, it, things can change and shift with the lightness of a feather blowing in the breeze. Instead of us trying to shift things at the physical level, it seems so hard, too hard to do. I don't want to, I don't know how, all these sorts of things. So, so that's why I always have people to get in a ceremonial space, to sit quietly, get in touch with themselves, have a candle, light the candle, have a, something to sit the candle on and have a book in front of you that you can write in. And so going through these exercises. So there's 16 exercises in my book, but people go one by one by one. And I do this in class too. Things like non-suffering, non-judgment. Who's Who are you judging? Who's judging you? And I found out I was even judging my son. I was pretty mad at him. That wasn't supposed to be, right? So when we sit in that way and we sit within prayerfully um, and calling in spirits, angels, guides, however, you know, whatever works for you, there's no right or wrong way. Um, and then burning it, taking something to the fire and allowing with the intention that it be released so that we can open our hearts to a different way, to different feelings, to different emotions. 
And so we know that ceremony works because whenever we go into a temple or a, a church of some kind and they have candles, it's almost like we are lemmings. We go right there, we light the candle, right? So what does, we know that that's a sacred place and we know that fire has power and shamans work with fire. We consider that the path to rapid transformation. And so we work with fire. We work in ceremony. We work in sacred space so that we're not dragging everything heavily, heavily, heavily. We're taking it to the fire. Please release this. Take this away for me and open my heart to other ways. It sounds so interesting. I have not been involved with anything like this, except for once I went on a retreat and got to spend a little time with the shaman. I remember, oh, the ceremony, which, I, you, know, you know, I don't think of ceremonies, but it all makes complete sense. And there were so many things this woman brought through. It was almost as if she had that, or I'm sure she did, that psychic ability and some of the things that I was seeing in my mind's eye, she was describing. And I thought, how is it that you're tied into exactly where I am and the drums? And uh, there was a ceremony at the beach and sending things off into the water and yeah. all of those things. Although I have not really experienced them, I think they're wonderful. And some of our cultures, indigenous cultures, this is what they've been doing for thousands of years. Yeah. And so in in churches, and I mean, if you get down to the, the basics for this, excuse me, I'm going to plug in something here because I'm going to go dead in a minute. No, no. <laughs> okay. Be a different kind of interview. That would yeah. be a different, that would be a very blank screen in a second. I just noticed that. So it, we know this. We, we've created sacred places all over the world. And many churches and um, shrines are at kind of energetic places, and places where there's a, a beautiful ceremonial energy. And so people miss that part. People may not miss organized religion, but they miss that sacred. We, we're all longing for the sacred. We're longing for ceremony. We're longing for belonging. And so this allows people to get into ceremony, to be in that ceremonial space and to um, tap into that energy of grief and grieving, and to really be able to use that, to move the energy of that grief through us. So many of my clients who come to me with autoimmune disease, cancer, if I go back far enough, I almost always find unresolved grief or loss. And so we want to, we want to move that energy because keeping it stuck is not healthy for us. Can you work with people through Zoom like we're talking now? Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Never thought of such a thing, but why not, right? Well, you know, quantum physics has shown us how this all works, where there's that great collective consciousness that we can tap into. So I can tap into your energy field and I can actually bring it in front of me and work on your energy field right, right here, right in front of me. Wow. Uh, yeah, I've done some different things in my past, dousing and things and moving energy and yeah, it's interesting how things happen in real time, even though you could be 3,000 miles away. It's pretty Absolutely. incredible. Let's talk a little bit about Ben in mm -hmm. communication these days, because you said you might not hear him, but um, I know, and you know, that people watching or listening right now desperately miss somebody and they would like any anything that you can give to let them know that their loved one is still around. Mm -hmm. When he communicates with you, is it subtle? What are some of the kind of ways that you know that he's still around? So it was different in the beginning. In the beginning, I couldn't hear him. I could sense him and kind of had that feeling. And, and many people describe that feeling. And they almost don't want to talk about it. It's one of the freaky little secrets a lot of time grieving people keep to themselves because they're afraid people are going to think they're crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And so we don't want to appear crazy. We already know that people are looking at us like, oh, she's grieving too long. She's grieving too much. And now she's seeing her loved one. She's really gone off. She needs an antipsychotic. Right? right. And so even in the um, uh, DSM diagnostical and statistical manual, there's extreme grief. Right. So that's considered an illness. Well, that is, you know, that's it's 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 our way of processing. We don't have a way of processing an outlet. And so um, 
over time, if you allow that feeling, that sense that maybe they're around, maybe they came visit, maybe the wind chimes blue on a day when there was no wind. Maybe there's a butterfly that lands on your nose or a certain bird that they liked or a certain sound that they like or perfume comes to you. If you allow yourself, instead of saying right away, oh, I must be imagining things, say, I am imagining wonderful things, right? Because we want to get in touch with our right brain, that brain where we can experience the beauty of the unknown, Instead of being stuck in our left brain, our left brain of daily facts, you know, facts only. We only want the facts and that's not factual. And so it must not be real. And if it's not real, then it's not important. But what if it's equally important? And so it's it's a process of tuning in and allowing yourself to be comforted by your loved ones on the other side and to look for these signs and synchronicities. You might be thinking of someone and all of a sudden, well, you know how it is. If you think of someone and all of a sudden they call, think about that happening in the other world too. You're thinking about them and all of a sudden they're there. You might feel that hand on your shoulder and allow yourself to just experience it. And as you experience it, it happens more and more. That's what happened with me. So then I became open to hearing him and seeing him and now we work together and and there was one point where I there was too many once people that are spirits that haven't passed over know that you can see them hear them know them they want to come they want help they want things and so that was a process of saying okay well I'm open for business now but I'm not open for business 24 7 right so I'll help people to cross over uh, when when I have the time and I'm in that space, I'm in my working space. So I don't know what your experience is. No, different. Yeah. My mind's just thinking, I, I have studied a lot with the mediumship of, um, in the Arthur Finley college and some of the greats that date back into the 1700s. And I personally, we are all open to our, our own opinions, but I don't believe people are stuck. We're here. We're there. I do think they stick around because they love us and they want us to know that, they are still around. Um, So I was just thinking of that. I I say that with each and every interview, nobody has to believe me. They don't have to believe our guest. but take what works for your life. What resonates is truth and hang on to it. Because I know, you know, there's a million different stories about what happens, but we're in the business of empowering people and helping them through grief and and getting back into life. Mm -hmm. Uh, But to answer your question, I feel that just like you said, when we think of them or when we have a really great memory that we had together or something funny, maybe that happened or remember this, you know, really thinking of something great, it raises our energy, but it's also like knocking on the door. I'm thinking of you and they're like, Hey, I'm here. I'm here. You know, that's the sign. I think once we're over there, we can multitask and be in a couple places at once, but they work through our imagination. And like you said, I mean, it's subtle and so many things that come into our mind. It's so easy for us to just brush off as, oh, that's just of our our imagination. But you've taken medium training, you know, I mean, that's, that's the avenue they work at, you know, so pay attention to those thoughts that come out of nowhere or those feelings, or if you smell the perfume or cologne, where you just get that feeling, you know, that gut instinct that they're around, that they really are. And sometimes people turn themselves off from that because they say, well, I believe that my loved one is in heaven. And so this can't, there can't be anything here. And I always tell people, well, it's not prison over there. (laughs) You're allowed to come back and forth. (laughs) You're so right. Yeah. And yeah, everybody's, everybody can have their own beliefs. And that's what we're Yeah. But for those that are interested, here we are. Tell us a little bit more about your book. And then I also want to talk a little bit about your website, karenjohnson.net, because there's a lot of good things on there. But tell us a little bit more about your book. Sure. Yeah. So so I take people through the medicine wheel. And so southwest, north and east, and, and they have different archetypal characters and they have a different quality. So in the south, we're really focusing on things that are keeping us stuck. Where are we? What are the stories that you're telling yourself ruminating over, over and over again? And this can keep people, I should have, I could go back to 
I probably was the wrong babysitter when I was two. And I, I should have sent him to a different school, right? I could just blame myself. Right. Right. And so, and so many other people, I should have made them go to the doctor. I should have, I knew that something was wrong. He didn't want to go. Well, she didn't want to go, but I should have, but, you know, so we get ourselves and we ruminate, ruminate. And then, and so allowing ourselves to get in touch with all those things that are bouncing around our head, write them on a piece of paper with the concept of letting them go, burning them is so freeing because then they're not just hanging around here. They have a mission. They're, we're offering it to spirit, to God, whatever you believe, to transform for us. And so we, we get released from it a little bit. Judgments, oh, so heavy. We judge ourselves so heavily. And, and who was judging us? Maybe we're judging our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers for not being there, for not being helpful. For, you know, so there's a lot of shame, blame, the guilt going on and allowing yourself to release those things so that new ways can enter in your heart is really freeing. Instead of carrying that heavy, heavy, heavy baggage and the beauty of burning it is we're not just writing in a journal that somebody can find and then beat us up with it and say, how could you say I wasn't there for you, blah, blah, blah. No, it's gone. You can be radically honest because it's just you and spirit. Talk love that. Love yeah. that. Radically honest. So nothing for anybody to find, nothing for anybody, nothing to come back at you. And so, yeah, so we just work with that. Oh, work with that. Great. Yeah. And then you said there's different practices. What did you say? 12 or 16 or yeah, 16, non-judgment. 16 non-suffering, non-attachment. And then we get to the East. We're in this uh, place of that I love. It's indigenous alchemy. Oh my gosh, that sounds so, what is that? Mysterious. Sounds, sounds great. Does it sound great? Yeah, I want it does. that. And I'm like, yeah. what the heck does that mean? So indigenous, if you just look, I just went to the dictionary. It means native or inherent. Alchemy is transformation. Mm -hmm. And so when you put them together, oh my gosh, what if we have an inherent, a native desire? for transformation. And what if being stuck in our grief and our belief systems really isn't for us? It really makes us leads to illness and sickness. And so what if this transformative process is really what we're supposed to do? That we're supposed to use this energy of grief and find a way to change our lives and create a new life out of the old one that honors our loved ones. What if that's really what it's supposed to be? It's not supposed to be this deadening, stuck experience, but a transformative, expansive experience. And how can we get some of that, right? How can we get there? And so this is what I learned on my two and a half year journey around the world, talking to shamans and priests and uh, Sufi masters and African shamans and all over the world. And it, it came down to this. It came down to this. We are supposed to learn from this. Death is here to guide us and teach us and help us transform. And it has that power. It has that I tell power. you, I heard someone, um, I can't remember which religion it was, but there was a, a death meditation where you go to bed every night and you think, you're not going to wake up in the morning um, and not to scare anybody, but it really gets us living life powerfully, really being in communication with people, really coming to grips with whatever our own spirituality is. Yeah. And it, I just thought I, I haven't done it too much, but, um, but very, very powerful to live life in the present tense Yes. As opposed to always thinking there'll be another day for you to do it. I mean, think of the relationships that you can have really living present. Yeah. And, and, and that concept really changes our neural network. So as we grieve and as we stay stuck in our grief, we're digging hopelessness, despair, sadness, deeper and deeper and deeper. But how do we get out of that? That's right. Like you say, living life. And, and that's called the beauty way. That's one of the 16 practices. So I always ask people, do one thing every day that brings beauty into your life. Watch a sunrise, sunset, flowers, whatever it is, one thing, a chocolate, whatever it is for you that brings beauty into your life. 
one thing every day that, you know, and every day and every day and every day. So you're developing this habit of looking for beauty. You know, we forget to stop and smell the roses, not only when we lose someone to grief, but when we're caregivers and or someone we're watching a child in addiction and just waiting every day. You don't know if they're going to live or die. We, we, we lose our ability to connect with beauty and we feel we don't deserve it or we can't have it or it's not appropriate or we shouldn't or whatever those things are. But we have to get back in touch with that because that is where we um, can connect with each other. We can create new lives out of the ashes of the old. We can help our loved ones in a new, in a different way, in a different and better way. When we're going spiraling downward, 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 and digging those things deeper and deeper, those neural networks of despair and hopelessness, we can become to come to a place we can't help anybody. And so this yeah. practice just practice, and I tell people write it and put it on a piece of paper, practice beauty and put it on your refrigerator and magnet. So every day you have to see that. And it reminds you to take a moment. Yeah. Also, another thing that the neural networks that get created are guilt, right? Yeah. I know that was something that came up with me and I made the practice. I didn't call it beauty. I used gratitude, but beauty works just fine. And every time I felt guilty about something or I should have had this conversation or I should have done it this way. No, nope. stop, pause. <laughs> We're going to substitute some gratitude or some beauty right here, right now. Yeah. Wow, it's very powerful words. So tell us about your website because I did a little lucky you got a lot going on there girl I do I have a lot going on so I I teach with the four winds and then I have my own classes that I teach and I like to um um so you can you can go on my website and sign up for classes and I have all different ones um there I have a five-week one where we actually go through all 16 practices and we do it on zoom and we do it on in community because it's so beautiful to see others trying to work with their grief and that are in grief and that you can talk to nobody there is going to tell you to stop or or they don't want to hear it or it's time to move on because we're all in it together and it's such a beautiful beautiful way and so when people talk about their experiences what they burned right for non-judgment or non-suffering uh then other people go oh yeah i'm gonna go back and burn that too i have that too right so sometimes you know, working together, working in community, we learn from each other and we say, oh, oh yeah, that I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I'm going to burn that. I'm going to burn this. And frantically, everybody's burning lists and, and sitting. And at the end, ah, we come together. And then I usually close with a journey to meet death, the angel of death. And people are, you know, people don't have to take the journey. But if they, when they take the journey, they're surprised, really surprised. It's not what it's, death is not that the hammer, sickle, that terrible creature that, that we're, we, we've been led to believe. And you get to speak with death and ask death questions and ask about your loved one and ask about the afterlife and have that time with death that is so precious. And so one of the biggest fears in our culture is the fear of dying. And so as we work through these practices and as we journey to meet death, I think the most precious thing that, that my son gave me was I no longer fear death because I know there's more. Without yeah, any doubt. I agree. I, there's definitely more. And wherever our loved ones stand looking at us right now, I mean, there's just... Our life here is just a, I heard this and I love this. Our life here is just a thread in the fabric of our soul. I mean, there's so much more that we can't even begin to understand, but we live our life thinking that this is reality. We're really, this is just the dream. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I always say I've had many incarnations in this lifetime. I, I think we all do. We're all changing and growing and experiencing and, and there's this and there's so much more. 
Absolutely. Yeah, none of us are the people we were years ago, nor right. would we want to go back. No, no. I drove for 30 years in the second worst traffic in the country and Washington, D.C. <laughs> I don't even want, I want to drive around there. I don't even want to go through it. Yeah, I, I don't like traffic myself. Oh, my gosh. Well, Karen, it has been so wonderful to have you on today. Do you have any closing words or anything coming up you want to share? Just reach into that beautiful soul. Yes, remember that, oh, my gosh, there is much more after life. And your loved ones are not gone. They're just right there. And so remember that your journey makes you happy, makes them happy. And allows you to tap into this transformative energy of grief and create something wonderful. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. Oh, and remind us the title of your book. It is Living Grieving, Using Energy Medicine to Alchemize Grief and Loss. And you can find it on Amazon or on Hay House website. Wonderful. Wonderful. Or on your website, there's a link. Or my website. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, it's really great meeting you. I love meeting new people. I know we're meeting on Zoom, but that's just kind of what we do these days, yeah. right? right? Until we can all get together again. But it's really been uh, great to have you here. And for our listener or our viewer, thank you for taking the time to be with us. There are a million other places that you could be, but you chose this moment to listen to Karen and I. It's all good. It's going after your purpose, going after your passion, finding out more about the reality of the afterlife. It is like Karen said, you know, those neural pathways can be created for all kinds of negative things, but we can create them for positive. And I believe when we get involved, we read a good book, we listen to a great show, we saw see an empowering movie, we take an empowering course that all moves us forward on this path called life and meet some great friends and be part of a community. And it really helps. So again, our home base is we don't die.com. Of course, you can pick up a free copy of my book there using coupon code free you can also join one of our upcoming classes. I know it makes a difference to experience our soul power, whether it's through psychic or mediumship or you know one of those things when you can actually feel something that you shouldn't be able to know you start realizing that i'm more than just this body and i really am a soul having a human experience also if you've enjoyed this show press the share button you never know who's having a bad day and i don't know how the universe works but i've heard some amazing stories of people seeing this show or listening to a podcast in the weirdest way. One fellow asked Siri on his phone to play some news and up popped We Don't Die Radio. And he had a young child who had passed and it made such a difference. I don't have all the answers, but I know, you know, that we come from a very good place that we just want to make a difference. And grief, like Karen says, has the power really to put us on our spiritual journey and transform our lives. So we are here with you and we're going to help you and give you everything we've got. Last, just a reminder, go to karenjohnson.net to find out more about our fabulous host, our fabulous guest. I'm a fabulous host too. Yes, but anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I get tongue tied because I get excited, but that's just part of being Sandra. So in closing, Yes, I'm Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So even if we can just take that one thing Karen said today and find beauty, that'll open up a whole new world. But of course, she's got so many more things. So I want to thank you for listening or for viewing, and we'll see you soon.